to manufacture their own jumpsuits and their own boots. And that's where Stanley Wiley was a supervisor. Although it's dangerous to work in a prison, turns out he was liked by everybody, including the inmates, except for Travis Reynolds. Travis was doing time for armed robbery, and he had a reputation for being a troublemaker, but not a killer. That all changed on January 29, 2003, when he slit Stanley Wiley's throat from ear to ear. He's been sitting on death row at the Polensky unit in Livingston, Texas, for almost 10 years. And I've gotten permission to meet with him face to face. Death row ostensibly holds the worst of all of the criminals. We walk into the Polensky unit, and there are flowers. There's inmates planting the flowers. And then once you get onto the campus, it's sterile, more like you're walking onto a college campus or a nursing home. So I went to sit to interview him, and he start, He looks at me, and he looks like he's sitting there waiting to get his school picture taken. He's sweet-looking. He's handsome. He's got this really sweet smile and these full lips. And he's a monster, right? But he doesn't look like a monster. Hi, Travis. Hello. I'm Dr. Michelle Ward. Okay. He's polite, full of yes ma'ams, no ma'ams. Who raised you? Was it your mom? When I was born, my mom and dad was already divorced. So I lived with my mom. It was hard because she was poor and her family was poor. So they lived like in, in the ghetto in South Dallas in a written down drug infested neighborhood. How it was normal, it was, a, it was a part of life for us. Alcohol, violence, fighting. Like my mom and her brothers, then they get drunk. They would fight, fist fight each other in the house, and we would have to go get my grandfather. He would come back to the house, and he had to stop them from fighting. Travis's cousin Joel confirms this. He says that Travis's mom was a combative woman and really encouraged her kids to be aggressive and violent. Well, Travis's father is my uncle. Travis's mother would say, you know, hey, if um, you can't beat somebody with your hands, get something and knock the shit out of them. Travis clearly came from an environment where crime was kind of normalized. Were you aggressive? I mean, I had to be. I mean, we emulated the behavior of our parents, what we saw them do. You know, we was at home, we got beatings and stuff. And so when we got to go outside with other kids, you know, it was our chance to take it out on other kids or fight. And sure enough, he became a petty criminal by the time he was a teenager. But they were nonviolent things, like stealing cars and robbing stores. I did over 30 burglaries. Did any of this make you nervous? No, I wasn't nervous. I was used to that. I suspect he's always kind of been a little bit egotistical. I suspect he's always kind of thought he could get away with stuff. I, I was on a high horse. I was never going to get caught. It didn't matter. And that kind of grandiosity seems like it was a, a theme, an underlying current throughout his life, even in his youth. I think he just truly got excited from it. I think it was just like a rush for him or something. Like, like some people bungee jump to get a thrill. It brought some kind of satisfaction to him. Obviously, I don't have the ability to test this, but I suspect that Travis could have a low resting heart rate. Now, this is an interesting biomarker for crime, and it's also really simple. There is a ton of evidence out there now that people with low resting heart rates, and that's literally fewer beats per minute, could go on to become criminal. Now, we have to be careful when we say that because, I mean, great athletes have low resting heart rates. There's lots of ways that you can have a low resting heart rate, but it's something that criminals often have. Having a low resting heart rate or just low arousal to begin with is uncomfortable, so these people become sensation seekers. Maybe some of them are... I don't know, crazy mountain bikers or, or very adventurous skiers or base jumpers, and others might become criminal. They're looking for the thrill, the rush to get their heart rate up. It could also be that if they have a low resting heart rate, they don't become nervous. Their heart doesn't race like ours does. So while most people with low resting heart rates are not criminal, it is a biomarker that we do see in criminals. One thing we know about Travis is that he has a bit of grandiosity. He thought he was way too clever to get caught. Seems like you have no fear of consequences. Well, I wouldn't say it was not having a fear of consequences. I would say it was more like I was illusioning myself 
that I wasn't going to get caught, so the consequences were irrelevant to me. Because you weren't going to get like, caught. Right, so if I'm not going to get caught, I'm not worried about the consequences. Now, as you sit across from me in death row, you're, you weren't right. You did get caught. I was wrong, right, so I was delusional. From police records, I know that on August 3rd, 1995, he committed a crime that would finally land him behind bars. An armed robbery of a woman in a parking lot. Travis claims there were three other guys who actually held the woman up at gunpoint. He only drove the getaway car. They say you held a sawed-off shotgun and you say it's not you. Well, it was, it was four of us. When we went to the apartments, they got out the car. I didn't even, I don't know, I don't even know who it was they robbed because I didn't get out the car. I was a part of it, but I wasn't the actual person who needed the robbery. I know I didn't do that robbery. Now, if they maybe got me for some other robbers, I could have understood, but that one I didn't do, so I wasn't worried about it. I don't have to say nothing to nobody because I know for a fact I didn't do that one. But the thing is, the victim picked him out of a lineup and says that he was the one who put the gun in her face. The DA offered Travis a plea deal, a way out. 15 years if you admit that you committed this crime. But Travis is like, I am innocent. Justice will prevail. I can beat this thing. It wound up being a terrible decision. I I never would have thought in my mind that I would be found guilty. I didn't even know how to react. I was just shocked. He was given this incredibly stiff 70-year sentence to make an example out of Travis. 70 years is a very extreme sentence for a robbery. Nobody got hurt, nobody got shot, no physical contact, nothing. 70 years, one robbery. The little hope I retained was, okay, the appeal. And I figured the way my trial went with no evidence, the appeal has to work. The appeal process is going to work. So you still had faith? Even though I done did some criminal things and broke the law, the system works to overturn what's right now, right or wrong. Then to top it off, his appeals are denied. That's when I lost all faith in the system. There's, There's no such thing as justice. If you're poor, you don't have proper representation, you're just a statistic. I think a lot of people in prison eventually accept their fate. That's not happening for Travis. From his perspective, he's thinking, I have never hurt anybody. I will never hurt anybody. And now I'm in jail with the company of murders and rapists. There is no way out. He becomes hopeless. And that's where you see happy-go-lucky Travis become a very bitter, resentful inmate. It made me have a lot of hate, anger inside for the system. Everything about the system, people that work for the system, everything about it, it just made me despise it because I knew what it stood for now. He takes all his anger out on the system. Among his many infractions, he punched one guard in the jaw and threw urine at another. What happened? Why did you throw urine at this guard? Of doing little petty things against me, like trying to mess with my food or not allowing me to go to wreck or shower, doing little picky things that they can get away with that would affect me in a major way because that's, that's all I have. I see. And I don't care who it is, me personally, I'm not going to let a person degrade me or disrespect me as a person. I can't allow it because then what do I stand for as a man if I can just be treated any kind of way? So it's revenge. Right. Travis is marinating in this anger, and he's pushing back, and he's getting in trouble. He's aggressing against guards, and then he's getting, you know, put in solitary. And the, the dynamic is just getting worse and worse and worse. But every time you assault a guard, you're going to get in trouble. There's going to be repercussions for that that can make right. your life a lot worse. Right. What happens to you? Come take all your property, take everything out your cell, write your disciplinary case put you on, like, restrictions where you can't have this property for 90 days. You can't have a mattress for, like, 72 hours. And so they take all your property and put you back in the cell with nothing. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Now, no, but at the time, all that matters was getting my revenge and then just whatever comes along with that, I just have to deal with it. By January of 2003, he had served seven years of his 70-year sentence. 
Travis had had lots of different jobs in the prison, but he was often moved for bad behavior. He had recently been demoted to janitor at the prison boot factory, and that's where Stanley Wiley was a supervisor. Travis was frustrated because he wanted to work in a different part of the prison. But they won't let you transfer. How did that make you feel? I couldn't take it. I wasn't going to take being treated like that anymore. And on the morning of January 29th, 2003, Travis felt pushed to the brink and unleashed all his rage on Stanley Wiley. I was like, you know what? The next person that comes to me for no reason whatsoever and picks at me or tries to throw trouble with me, I'm going to do something with him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something to hurt him. I don't know why specifically Wiley was targeted. He was basically at the wrong place at the wrong time. I really feel like it could have been anybody. I I think Wiley was symbolic for Travis. You're part of the system, and I'm going to show the system what I will do. Don't mess with me. Part of the assembly line in the boot factory was a station where inmates would use really sharp knives to cut leather. Travis was in the boot factory to sweep the floor. He was not one of the people authorized to use a knife. Travis went up to an older inmate and said, Hey, can I borrow your knife? I need to cut my thermals. At, what, at this point, did you know you were going to go slit somebody's throat? No, I knew I was going to use it, but I didn't know actually how I was going to use it. I just knew I was going to use this knife on this person. He has a plan, and he's executing the plan carefully. I walked behind him, and I grabbed him, and I cut him, cut him across his throat. This is a cold-blooded murder. He was in complete control. Travis calmly walks over to Wiley, calmly pulls his head back and slices his throat, and then just cleaned the knife and walked away. He's able to plan it and commit it without skipping a beat. We're all able to do things we didn't think we could when we're mad in the heat of a moment during battle, but not when it's planned out like this. It takes a very detached, cold person. What were you thinking and feeling? Uh, I can't, I don't know. I think my mind maybe was blank. I was just, it, it probably really wasn't no thought. I just didn't have any thoughts, but just... To, us, to, to hurt somebody. Had you ever felt that before? No, honestly, no. That was the first time I've ever felt like that. Just, I just wanted to just really, really hurt somebody because I, it's just like everything accumulated to that moment. Everything I've felt and hurt had happened to me just accumulated to this moment that I've, this is it. And the thing that registered most in my mind is that when he fell, he turned around and he looked at me and he just looked at me and, and I looked at him And at that point, I realized what I had done. And so when you look into another person's eyes and you can see what's going on in their their eyes, it affects you. It it affected me to see what I had done. The way he describes the feelings that he had when he committed the murder indicates to me that he didn't expect to feel any sort of emotion attached to it, but he did, which I think shocked him. And he feels the, the disgust, the sadness, the remorse, and the empathy for his, his victim. Does this mean he's not dangerous? Absolutely not. It does mean, however, if he's being honest about what he felt, that you know, although he can commit these crimes, he does experience remorse for them. And when I seen his hand in his throat, I knew there's something, I can't take that pack. I can't do it. It's already done. I have definitely seen prison make criminals worse. I haven't seen somebody who had a a relatively nonviolent past become such a cold-blooded killer in prison. This kind of assassination, that's unique. Tell me why the other inmates aren't killing people. I mean, it's not something I can answer because, you know, Everybody deals with things and problems and and adversity in different ways, you know. 
I deal with mine maybe in the wrong way. I let my emotions cloud my judgment and, and make a, a really bad decision in life. On October 28, 2005, Travis was sentenced to death for the murder. He was moved from the Clements unit in Amarillo to death row in Livingston, where we are now. Do you think that you deserve to be on death row? I would have to. I would say morally, no. But responsibility is for the laws in Texas, according to the law. Yes. When I was there interviewing him, I thought he meant he wasn't morally responsible because he had been driven to the crime. But I don't think that's what he meant at all. Now that I've had time to reflect on it, I think he meant that he's morally against the death penalty as an institution, but that he recognizes he committed the crime that could legally put him there. Travis has become such an icon for the anti-capital punishment movement. In fact, through a pen pal, he has created a blog called wordsbytravis.com where he talks about all kinds of problems in the judicial system and in the in his particular prison. He talks about the limitations on what he can read, what he can eat, what happens to his fellow inmates, et cetera, et cetera. And his attention is even international. Do people visit you? Yeah, I get, I get visits from people overseas every now and then, like from different countries. Like last week, I got a visit from my friend. She's, she's French, but she lives in the Netherlands. So she flew all the way to visit you? Yes, yes, she flew. This is like the fourth time she's been to visit me. But the reality is Travis has exhausted his state appeals. He has two federal appeals left. And he is currently waiting to hear about his execution date. Death is coming, and likely soon. Are you afraid? No, I, I, I'm not afraid because I found peace with myself. You know, I forgave myself, and I've got right with what I believe in. So, no, I'm not scared because, I mean, I've lived my life, and I, and I made choices. And so now I have to be a man and accept what comes with those choices. You know, I, I can't expect anything less. Rehabilitation for criminals at this level is extremely tough. You don't see a lot of it. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity for rehabilitation, frankly, at this level. You're, you know, they might become model prisoners, but they're not getting out. Part of me thinks that there was probably a relief in Travis when he finally committed a crime that justified his sentence. Anything you want to say to Mr. Wiley's family? No, I mean, I can't ask for forgiveness. They, it's something they have to give. I can't ask for it. Forgiveness is something you have to give. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Even when someone has a terminal illness, 